if we measure the voltage difference, the electric potential difference between the two sides of the membrane of a resting neuron, we'll see the value is equal to about negative 70 millivolts. And this is what we call the resting membrane potential of that cell, the resting membrane voltage. Now, the question is, what exactly establishes the resting membrane potential? Where does it actually come from? And more precisely, how can we actually measure the resting potential, the resting membrane potential of a cell? So, how can we calculate the value of negative 70 millivolts? Well, let's begin by taking a look at the following diagram. So this is our phospholipid bilayer membrane, and in that membrane, we have some type of ion channel. Now, this ion channel in this diagram is closed, and it will not allow the movement of any one of these ions. And let's suppose we're only focusing on two different types of ions. So we have these positively charged orange ions and these negatively charged green ions. Now, because this is closed, and because the membrane is predominantly hydrophobic nonpolar, none of these ions will begin to pass across, even though we have a concentration gradient that exists between the two sides. So we have a higher concentration here, so this is the higher concentration potential, a lower concentration here for both of these ions, so this is the lower potential, and that creates this concentration gradient. And so if we somehow create a pathway, these ions will want to move spontaneously this way. So when we open up these channel, this channel, what begins to happen? Well, let's suppose the channel is a specific ion channel and it only allows the movement of these cations. It doesn't allow the movement of the anion. So as we open it up, what happens is because of this concentration difference that exists between the two sides, these positively charged ions will begin to move spontaneously from this side to this side. But what happens over time, the rate of movement begins to decrease until the rate of movement is equal to zero. The question is, why does that actually take place? Why does the rate of movement of these cations from this side to this side ultimately decrease to zero? Well, as these cations are brought to this side, as they move to this side, that increases the total amount of positive charge on this side of the membrane because as each one of these cations move this way, it brings with it a full positive charge. And so as each one of these cations move this way, as a result of that positive charge buildup, they begin to feel an electrostatic repulsive force due to that positive charge buildup. And so that's why the rate begins to decrease. And eventually, when the force due to that concentration gradient is equal to the force due to that electric repulsion, when these two forces are equal because they point in opposite directions, if we sum them up, the net force will be equal to zero. And we know by Newton's second law of motion, if the net force is zero, they will not actually move across that cell membrane. And this moment in time is known as the equilibrium point. So when these cations reach their equilibrium point, there will still be a uh, uh, there will still be an unequal distribution of these molecules these ions and at that moment in time we can calculate exactly what that voltage potential difference is what that voltage difference is between the two sides of the membrane and if we carry the same exact procedure out with the other ions and then we take the average of those values that will give us the resting membrane potential so the electric potential difference across the membrane at the equilibrium point is what we call the resting membrane potential. So the resting potential is a result of the existence of the unequal distribution of these charged ions across that cell membrane. And the next question is, how can we actually calculate what the resting membrane potential is? And to demonstrate this, let's use two types of ions. So we're going to look at sodium as well as potassium. So this is our membrane. Now, 
For a resting cell, for a resting neuron, the inside concentration of sodium is about 14 milli uh, millimolar, the outside concentration is about 143 millimolar, the inner concentration of potassium is about 157, and the outer concentration is about 4 millimolar. <coughs> Now, from basic chemistry, we know that to calculate the voltage difference between these two points as a result of the unequal distribution of these two charged species, all we have to do is use the Nernst equation. So, the voltage due to the concentration difference between some ion X is equal to the negative of RT divided by ZF where R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, Z is the charge on that ion, and F is Faraday's constant. We multiply this ratio by the natural log of the ratio of the concentration of the inside to the concentration of the outside. So this is the equation that we can use to actually calculate what the voltage difference is at the equilibrium point for each one of these two ions. So let's begin with sodium. So for sodium, so the gas constant is, is 8.314 joules mol, uh, divided by moles times Kelvin. The Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs per mole. Z for sodium is, well, we have a charge of positive 1. And the T, well, let's assume we're at our cellular temperature. That's about 37 degrees Celsius. So 37 plus 273, that gives us 310 Kelvin, and so T is 310 Kelvin. So we plug these values in, then we plug in 14 millimolar for this X in, and then we plug in 143 millimolar for the X out. And so because the natural log of a ratio that is less than one is negative, this negative value becomes a positive, and so we get a value of about positive 0.062 volts. And if we multiply this by 1000, that gives us the value in millivolts. So 62 millivolts is the electric potential difference between the two sides due to these sodium ions. So if we omit all the other ions that are present across the two sides, then what that means is in such a case, the resting memory potential of that cell would simply be equal to positive 62 millivolts. But we know we have other ions present across the cell membrane. For instance, we have this potassium. So let's carry out that same procedure with potassium. So we plug in our constants. So notice that the charge is also positive one. And now we plug in our concentrations. And now this higher concentration is at the top. And so natural log of a ratio that is greater than 1 will be a positive number, and so this will remain negative. And if we plug this into our calculator, we get about negative 0.098 volts, or equivalent to negative 98 millivolts. So what that means is, if we are only considering these two ions, and if we assume that the membrane is impermeable to either one of these ions, that means all these ion channels are actually closed, and if we omit, if we neglect all the other ions to calculate the actual resting memory potential, all we have to do is find the average of these two values. And so the average of these two values is about negative 18 millivolts. So we can basically approximate this to around negative 20 millivolts. Now, the question is, why then is the resting memory potential of our resting neuron negative 70 millivolts? Why isn't it this quantity? Well, first of all, because we also have other ions across that cell membrane. And so we have to also consider the voltages of those other ions. And that's why this value will actually change. But that's not the most important factor that actually determines this quantity. The more important factor is the following. It turns out that the potassium ion channels are actually more permeable to potassium than the sodium ion channels are permeable to sodium. In fact, 
we actually have these, uh, these potassium ion channels that are open within that membrane. And if we have some of these potassium ion channels open along that resting membrane, what that means is we'll have a movement, a leakage of these K plus ions out of that cell. And that leakage will basically drive this value to a more negative value. It will basically decrease it. And that's exactly why the actual resting membrane potential is actually way closer to this value than to this value because of those uh, because of those uh, K plus ion channels. So because the potassium ion channels are actually open, some of them are open, what that means is this will be closer to this value than to this value. And that's exactly why it's around negative 70 millivolts, which is closer to this than to, th uh, than to this value. So we see that in the absence of other ions and assuming all ion channels are closed and the membrane is impermeable to either one of these ions, in such a case, the resting memory potential would simply be the average of these two values, which is around negative 20 millivolts. But that is not the case. Why? Well, it turns out that some of the K plus ion channels are actually open. So they're more permeable to the K plus than the sodium channels are permeable to the Na plus. And so this causes the leaking of the positive charge out of that cell because some of these K plus ions can actually leak out through those open channels and that basically makes this value more negative. It decreases it to a value of around negative 70 millivolts. So we see that the resting membrane potential is basically the average of all these different voltages that exist due to the unequal distribution of all these different ions. So we conclude that the resting potential is a result of the unequal distribution of these ions that exist along or across that resting membrane.